Paul, over to you. Thank you very much, Samir. That was a fantastic talk and a great segue. My goal is just talk about some surgical tips and some surgical ideas uh, and just some of the things I've learned or not learned. Uh, just by virtue of, of disclosure, I do have some conflicts, none of which will be an issue in this talk today. Um, Samir really sort of touched on the first tip, I think. The first tip about ideal orthopedic surgery is proper indications and understanding why someone failed, if they had previous surgery, and the anatomic factors such as bone loss, whether it's subcritical or not, whether it's combined bone loss or whether it's inadequate tissue. So understanding the indications. We touched briefly on the, I, uh, the ISIS score, uh, an unfortunate name uh, at, at the time. And while I don't believe that it plays a major role in me selecting uh, exactly how I do things, it does play a role in how I think about how to indicate surgery. And then perhaps instead of ladder J for all, there will be more of a role as Dr. Murthy will talk about as open shift for some. Step one, identifying bone loss. Well, the first thing you wanna do is have an index of suspicion during your history. If someone's had multiple episodes, if they have very easy instability, if they fall out or have dislocations while sleeping, um, then, then it's a concern. Bone loss is more common than not. Not that we always need to treat it, but it's more common than not. And when you have a question, when you think about bone loss, in my mind, it's a little bit about like calf pain. If you think about calf pain, you get an ultrasound to check for a DVT. If you're worried about bone loss, then I'm going to go ahead and get um and get a uh, get get a CAT scan just to look at the degree of instability. When you examine these patients on physical examination, you want to look for their bait and signs. You want to look for generalized hyperlaxity. You want to make sure that that this that, that they don't have a lot of external rotation at the side uh, and certainly other other issues. Uh, this can play a role in how you choose what to do. So great, let's go to the OR. That's what we're all excited to talk about, um, your setup. Well, you can position the patient any which way you want. You can position them in beach chair or lateral, but let me save literature and discussion and argument. Lateral is better. It's just that simple. You can see in the back, you can see posterior or inferior. If you have numerous assistants, you can hold and position and manipulate your arm. I'm convinced you can do good surgery. But for the general person out there, I would, I would argue that lateral is better. One of my own uh, thesis is that examination under anesthesia matters a lot. Here's two different cases, one with a small bony bank cart. And as I examine him, I can see, oh, uh, uh, he rotated a little bit for me, uh, but he comes out in a grade two fashion. Here, with a little bit more bone loss, I can see that this person has a grade three instability, comes out, stays out, and locks out. This is a different challenge to me. And while, while I think you can address some grade three instability arthroscopically, I want to think about it differently. And, and certainly, I'm going to do a bank cart plus. And whether that involves posterior sutures, rhomplissage, uh, conjoint tendon move, something different is going to happen at that surgery. Making the appropriate portals. Well, I, I think we used to be really fixed on which portals you must make. You really have a lot of options, but anterior and anterior, inferior, anterior, superior, where I've made my red lines are my workhorse portals. One right at the level of the biceps and one at the level of subscapularis, but farther lateral in the, in the rotator interval so that you can come down and not sky. Certainly you can be posterior lateral, posterior, posterior inferior, transcuff, percutaneous. There's a lot of ways to skin this cat. The idea is that you want to come down and be able to address the inferior labrum and inferior glenoid in a comprehensive fashion. Portals matter. This slide sort of helps you think about how using the posterior portal, which is where I see most surgeons sort of think, oh gosh, I can put in my anchors from my posterior portal. But if you look at the difference in the trajectory of this of this probe versus this spinal needle, you could imagine that you're gonna really enter the glenoid in a different fashion. There's really no worse feeling than you running a drill along the glenoid and seeing the cartilage bubble below you. Because we know that in five to 10 years, that's gonna be significant arthrosis. It's not something that we easily get away with. So I wanna be very careful. And here you can see just an example of drilling. This is again from posterior, but I really wanna be at, a, at an angle that where I'm not going to enter the articular cartilage of, of the glenoid or damage it. 
We can get talking about getting close to it, but you certainly don't want to skive, undermine, or bubble that cartilage. So these are really important. To me, I want to look from the front and the back during, beginning, and after surgery. So as a, as a consequence, what I'm going to do is I'm going to place three cannulas in a typical case, an anterior inferior, an anterior superior, and a posterior. And what placing the cannulas allows me to do is move from front to back without thinking twice, without saying that there's any kind of hurdle to doing this operation. Um, you can be slick, you can do this cannula free, you can do this through one cannula. That's the least expensive portion of this operation. I just don't wanna be encumbered or limited by my view. I want to retension this ligament. I want to get the labrum back on and address the plastic deformity. And then I wanna figure out how I'm gonna get this done. So here's just sort of some steps in that procedure where at first I'm just using a blunt instrument. And I wanna release, release the, the labrum and the capsule off. And you can see it's sort of pinned a little medially. It's not free floating. Then I can use an, uh, an elevator or a liberator, whichever device how you want to call it, but I'm slowly gonna work and I wanna get to the point of seeing subscapularis fibers below me and taking my time on this step, really releasing it. And you'll see in a couple seconds when I'm done releasing it, it floats freely. Again, I'm going to switch my portals. I'm going to move from, side, from back to front and really get around and take my time and get this elevated. A little flash of blood doesn't scare me. It'll go away in a couple of seconds. You're really, you're breaking up adhesions here. Taking your time, really working your way around. And this is, this is slow. Preparing the, uh, the bed. There's lots of ways we can talk about doing this one. I'm going to show you another one in a couple of seconds. But here's the issue. Floating up. That's what I want to see. I want to see the labrum gone from where it was stuck down to floating up. Just a slightly different look here, looking from the front. Now I'm using an open curette, and this is a Sanjay Desai technique where you're going to clean the cartilage. You can come across the labrum with a more steep liberator and really get to the posterior labrum from anterior and vice versa. So I think those are some nice, nice tricks. And here I might put in my, my most inferior anchor. Uh, I'll leave that behind and I won't tension that fully, but I, I like using posterior inferior anchors. I want to capture the tissue well. So if I'm going to use a suture material, I'm going to think about using a luggage tag or a cinch suture. I like using these tapes uh, and simple sutures are, are an option at, uh, you know, as well, but perhaps our third in my armamentarium. I may use a mattress when I'm using just a single line of suture alone. Here's another trick where I can reach down and I want to tension my ligament. So before I make my final tie, here I'm using a knotless device, but I'm going to tension the tissue. And the tissue, once it's tensioned, then I can really get my shift and my repair. And I do that whether I'm using a knotless or a knotted device, I'm going to take my capsule labral complex and tension it up before I get it into place. I do like to use knotless as much as I can. Uh, I think that there can be less abrasion and I'm really amazed uh, at, at the number of cartilaginous injuries that perhaps I and we have caused by, uh, by doing surgeries uh, and by thinking we're, we're very benign, but these knots can be issues in the size of the anchor I think matters. You wanna get down really low, right? And, and getting down really low to try and address this tissue is the hardest but the most important part of the case. You can do that through an optimized portal, really getting down low on the subscapularis and a loose shoulder and a multi-directional shoulder. This is quite easy. Using curved delivery devices, I think can become important. And you can also go percutaneously trans subscapularis to place an anchor just the same. An important tip here is to not skive consistently with three drill holes and create a potential postage stamp or a glenoid fracture. So you really want to try and be perpendicular to the glenoid in each of your drill holes and not progressive skives to create a subsequent osteotomy. There are all sorts of commercially available percutaneous devices, but I think you can get down pretty darn low with, with either a simple curved or a percutaneous hole through the subscapularis. The discussion about a posterior inferior suture anchor is often debated in a collision athlete. I'm going to put in this posterior inferior anchor in just about all of them. And here the tissue is not torn all the way around past the six o'clock, but I'll use, a, I'll, I'll grab a loop of this stitch. I'll pass it through. I'm using a lasso here, and this is how I'll typically bite tissue. And this is gonna be a knotless anchor. And the trick for me on this is I will not tighten it up 
entirely. I'll pass it, I'll have it ready, and it's kind of going to sit there and do its thing. It can be extra cannula for me if I want it to be, but it's just going to sit there like a loop of tissue as I sort of get it down and close to tension, right? But I'll leave it somewhere. I just have to uh, un unwind it a little bit. But I'll leave it somewhere around here. And now I'll go do my anterior work. I'll finish my anterior work, get everything done in the front of the shoulder. This happens to be all multidirectional. And at the end, I'll come back and close up that posterior recess. So I'm not fighting myself so much. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I want to have respect for Alps lesions. I know overseas you don't get to some of the, uh, the, the instabilities as quickly as we do in the United States, but Alps lesions are not going to do as well. So when it's really medialized and the tissue is of poor quality, I'm going to be very, very methodical. I'm going to think about two suit, a double loaded suture anchor, passing from posterior, really adequate preparation, and having some sort of plan or alternate level of, of uh, stabilization uh, and an example of that will be, you know, adding a remplissage. For many of us, this kind of engaging hill sacs is going to immediately sort of shift us over to open surgery. But if you're sort of unprepared or haven't thought about it, I think adding a remplissage or a infraspinatus capsulodesis uh, can be helpful. I'll place the anchors right at the articular margin. Depending upon how strong the bone is, I can sometimes use a labral type anchor, but this bone was somewhat soft and there's what's happening. I'm pulling the capsule and the tendon of the, of the infraspinatus, and then, then I'll go back and do my, uh, my hill sacs. I think that's it. I'm out of time, uh, and I've given uh, some points that are valid. I'm going to switch it over now to my colleague, Dr. Murthy, who's going to tell us about some alternative thoughts.